Welcome back to our video series on designing a LNA, a mimic LNA, using the TriQuin PED process. Uh, when we left off last time, we had just gotten done optimizing the input match on the front end of the LNA, um, the old critical uh, L and C, for getting that input match just right for our 5.8 uh, gigahertz LNA. Well, today we're going to get real. We're going to start doing the layout, actually, and we're going to begin by focusing in on that, on that all-important inductor. Um, previously, we've been using um, idealized components, a capacitor for our um, C portion of the input match, and uh, we actually got to an inductor with Q, which is a slightly less idealized because we're actually uh, taking into account the loss. It's slightly less idealized than just a pure inductance. Um, but now we're actually going to go to the triquint PDK, and we're going to pull out of that PDK an element that's a real element from that library. We're going to use a microstrip rectangular inductor or a spiral inductor, and this is a model that's been um, fit for the uh, triquin process, so it represents exactly the metallization that's capable within the process. And from our previous study, we decided that about uh, six segments, which is a turn and a half, and a 10 on 10 pitch, which uh, just means that we're going to have a line width of 10 and a spacing of 10, uh, that should give us about our 0.95 um, uh, nanohenries of inductance that we were looking for, uh, and a sufficiently high Q to um, to get us the noise figure we wanted. So I've dropped that in here. Let's go back to our simulation and see what we get. And in point of fact, we do get about the same performance we got with our idealized um, initial design. We're getting about 18, 18 and a half dB a gain. We're getting a rather good uh, 1.6 or less dB noise figure. And you can see we um, we still have a fairly stable design, although we're going to have to keep an eye on that because stability is going to be an issue with all this gain and, and with the um, resonating input match. Uh, we want to keep an eye on that as the design develops. Now, the next thing we're going to want to do is go to the layout and begin placing these components in a in a fashion that's um, going to allow us to realize and manufacture a successful LNA. Uh, right now, there's a jumble of parts, but the interesting thing is that the parts are here, and that's purely a function of the unified data model inside the AWR database. While we've been putting our schematic together, these parts have been appearing on the layout, even though we haven't been watching the layout or paying any attention to the layout, simply because the layout is using the same entries in the database as the schematic. So every change we make on the schematic, every element we place on the schematic that has a representation in the layout, it's there waiting for us. So how are we going to separate, separate out this all-important input match from the rest of the circuit? Well, we can go back to the schematic, and we can select just the components that we want to deal with for the time being. And I'll select those from the input circuit. The input capacitance doesn't appear yet on the layout, and that's because we haven't put it into an element that's represented in the PDK, and therefore there's no representation for this idealized device. Although I could go in, and um, for this one capacitor, I could put a representation in if I wanted some sort of a placeholder, but it certainly wouldn't be DRC or LVS correct with regard to Triquin's design rules. So I've selected these input matching components. I can execute a very simple command by a right mouse click. I could do the select and layout command, which is not only going to send me over to the layout, but it's also already selected the elements that were in the corresponding select set in the layout. And I can move those off to the side, and now I can start working with them as a group and placing them in the um, in the general area that I'd like to see them placed. Now, you, you will have noticed that in the in, in the schematic, I have the input matching network um, totally represented in microstrip and components. So there's no arbitrary routing that has to go in here. We're going to have every bit of routing between these components represented by a microstrip or similar element on the schematic. So it's really all here right now in, in what I've selected. But the orientation isn't quite right. Um, I'd like to work more in a left to right sort of um, representation, and that's uh, simply by convention, but in general when we're talking about amplifiers with high gain, we really want the input on the opposite side of the chip from the output. And the reason why is we want to be able to maximize the isolation when we put this chip into a package or on a module so that we reduce the chance of having a package or um, module related resonance by coupling input to output and getting a feedback path that would um, cause an oscillation. So we're going to want to have the uh, input pad all the way to the left and the output pad of this LNA all the way to the right. And so to do that, I really need to rotate this whole structure by about 180 degrees, or actually exactly 180 degrees. And I'll move that up over here, uh, and we can center that again. And you can see that there's the implied connectivity to our first stage FET here, and uh, that's the via for the source to ground that. Um, let me just select all those as a group, and we'll just bring them right up. 
right over there. And you can see that the connection is actually to the opposite side. So I'm going to have to flip or rotate this thing. I'm going to flip it because we want that via up on top. We want to keep that via away from the spiral inductor because you could see uh, the proximity of it would sort of overlap and that would create a, a little issue with routing our um, our spiral inductor there. So we'll keep that source via up there for the moment. Uh, in a later video, you'll see we're going to add a second uh, via and that will create some issues down here, which we'll have to be careful about the spacing as such, but we'll uh, get to that in a later video. Uh, let me zoom in on this section here. And now let's just um, try to get all this to snap together properly. Um, what I have in terms of um, snapping features is um, the snap together key, which I'll show you the functionality of that in a moment. And I can have things automatically snap on parameter changes, or I can snap for all objects manually, or I can just snap selected objects. So I'm going to snap selected objects for now, and I'm going to zoom out a bit and we'll select all this and I'll add our inductor to that select set. And I'm going to go over here to this button, the snap together button. And what that's going to do is just bring everything nicely together in a concise sort of way. Let me get that via over there in this select set. And our little microstrip line at the bottom over here, we'll move those over again. And I snap together and you can see, look, it's all come together exactly like we would like it to be on the layout. Now there's a couple things that we want to be careful of here. One is this inductor is still sort of close to that uh, that FET there. We may want to push that away. Additionally, uh, we have a big capacitor or um, a capacitor that's important to us at the very least that's going to be sitting in this area over here and we want to be uh, watchful of any coupling that's going to go between that uh, inductor and that capacitor. Uh, so we may want to start thinking about ways that we can move this inductor uh, down and to the left here away from the FET and away from that capacitor. And what we can do is go back into uh, the schematic and we can select for tuning that microstrip line and this microstrip line right there. And that's going to, uh, if we make those lines longer because their pin one is positioned here and here against the T, that'll act to push the inductor down and to the left, just like we would like as we begin to um, lay that out. Uh, while we do that, though, we're going to want to look at the gain noise figure and stability of this. And we want to do it, though, in the context of the layout. We want to do that so that we can get the spacing right. So we'll be looking at the, uh, the layout moving at the same time that we're going to be looking at the... Um, the gain and noise figure moving down and to the um, to the left. Now, if I'm doing that and I'm in this manual snap mode that I set a moment earlier, I'm not going to get the layout to update properly. We'll, we'll see the lines get longer, but the structures won't move. So let's go back to the layout options and go into an auto snap mode. Okay, and now we will pull up the tuner. And when we do that, now, uh, with the recording software that I'm using to capture this video, there's a bit of a delay, and uh, my laptop is not a high-performance workstation that I'm recording this on. So um, as I move this, you'll see a bit of a delay, but eventually you will see um, the inductor move down, and there you go. We see the FET moving to the right, which is the same as the inductor moving to the left. And now when I move this, we'll go down. But you can see the whole structure stays together. And that's a wonderful feature of the unified data model where we're coordinating parameter changes through the variable tuner here, um, which are updating values on the schematic ostensibly. But what it's really doing is reaching down into the data model and updating the database as a whole. So the layout is reflected immediately in those changes and the layout essentially updates itself as we're doing this. If we go and look at our performance criteria, as I begin to um, move the FET away and making that T-junction line a little bit longer. There's really not that much effect. Um, we're rather insensitive to that. But I think this line over here is going to show a bit of sensitivity to gain in noise figure um, as we move the inductor in and out. Uh, maybe it's not as sensitive as I thought. Um, but there is a bit of sensitivity there, um, just a slight one. So we're going to keep an eye on that as well. But the effect of being able to do this is that we can look at our uh, layout constraints of not wanting to have some components coupling to each other at the same time that we're looking at um, the effect on um, the performance. Now, one of the other things that we're going to have to keep an eye on is um, this little bit of line length here. Now, um, we're going to want to have a ground pad somewhere down here so we can get um, off chip, if you will, and um, get things grounded 
very well, or we're going to want to have um, some bias along these lines, uh, along this side as well. So uh, what we're going to need to do is meander this line back over to this part of the chip over here, because we'll probably have an input pad here, and this will be running off chip a bit. If we want to stay with our six-turn inductor, we're going to have to meander this line back over, and we want to capture that in our simulation as well, so we just don't want to put down a hunk of metal. Um, there's a very simple way that we can go and handle that in the AWR design environment. What we can do is instead of just using an MLIN, which is a straight line, we can dynamically change this simply by clicking on the symbol name and putting in mtrace. mtrace is a modeled meandered line. It allows us to go into the the layout and uh, pretty much route a, f a freely drawn line with um, mitered bends if we want. Um, but what it also does is it it uh, captures those bends and line segments and tiles together the very same model uh, on the schematic that we would use if we just had the MLIN and MBEN model. So we can go back to the layout now. And you can see that nothing's really changed except that the line has shifted a little bit. And that's because there's a different cell drawing routine that's used for that model. But I'll use our snap together command. And if we go and look at the simulation, the simulation hasn't changed at all because it's still the same microstrip line that we're modeling. But now I can go to the layout and I can start to meander that line simply by double clicking on the endpoint and routing a line. Okay, and now because I've made the line longer and I've incorporated a bend, there will be a change. You can see the effect of making that line longer is adding more inductance to our uh, our shunt path there, which is pushing up the gain and pushing it to a lower frequency. And uh, it's also giving us a little bit of trouble on our um, stability there, but we can now meander that line and route it however we want and be very flexible in the layout, whereas we didn't have that flexibility previously, while simultaneously being able to simulate and watch the effect of our um, freely routed line. Now there's one final thing I want to show you in terms of putting together this fundamental layout here. We really haven't talked about metallization layers. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can um, go in and change the layer of metal that we're on by going into the shape properties and selecting a different line type. Line types correspond to routable uh, layers of metal that um, can be modeled in terms of their loss, um, can be sent to the EM simulator and are properly represented in the layout. So I can change that if I want to a metal one from metal zero and you can see there the change. Um, but more importantly, what we want to make sure happens is as we're changing some of those lines, perhaps so we can route one line underneath another, that the things that they're connected to are appropriately updated. And in mimic design, that's essential because we're always inserting or needing to insert vias when we go to dissimilar metal layers. You can see here that as I go from my spiral inductor to my M trace, there's no via needed because the spiral inductor is realized on uh, metal one and two. But if we go back, to metal zero for our line type here, you can see that um, a V has been inserted. Now, how has that happened? Well, inside the AWR design environment is something called bridge code. And what bridge code is, is um, the smarts to know what's connected to what and what uh, the foundry design rules say about making sure that those metal layers are making good electrical contact. So you can see here as we go from our spiral inductor, which is in metal one and metal two, to our M trace in metal zero, a via gets inserted that's properly drawn based on the different line widths and the different uh, metal types. Um, that connection is sensitive not only to the metallization that's um, on the uh, on the inductor or on the M trace and the difference between the two, but it's also sensitive to the connectivity in the schematic. So what do I mean by that? Well, here we have a via drawn, and if I go back to the schematic and I select that spiral inductor and disconnect it simply by drawing it over with the control key down, and now I go back to our 3D view, you'll see that the V is gone. Um, now the line hasn't moved at all, the spiral inductor hasn't moved at all because I haven't changed the layout, but what has changed is the connectivity in the schematic. So the M trace doesn't know what it's being connected to and therefore the environment can't draw the appropriate uh, via. But if I go back to the schematic and simply just make that one connection, let me make it on the other side to the one that we actually care about, I make it to the M trace that we're looking at and now I go back you can see that the V has been drawn in place. And if I go to the layout and now change different metal layers, again, that V will change or disappear altogether. If we go back to metal one, you can see there's no V now. So that's bridge code. Um, we've looked at uh, the TriQuint PDK. 
in uh, in a little bit more detail today with regard to getting real, getting onto the layout, and we looked at the microstrip rectangular inductor, which provides a very accurate simulation model, but also gives us the complexity in the layout that we need automatically by drawing the device properly and DRC correct. Um, we've also looked at the ability to tune uh, while manipulating both the schematic and the layout and seeing the effect on the um, on the performance goals. Well, that's it for this segment. Um, in the next segment, we'll go more deeply into the layout. If you'd like more information about bridge code, about uh, the complexity and, and um, modeling support and cell generation in the TriQuint uh, PDK, uh, or you'd like more information about some of the features I showed you in terms of manipulating the AWR layout environment, uh, there's plenty of information on the AWR website. Uh, download a copy of Microwave Office and try some of this out yourself with the um, AWR Mimic process, a generic process um, that allows you to play around with some of these things. And if you still have some questions, I encourage you to contact your AWR sales professional.